Thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Watson, and this is the Influence Watch podcast. In this episode, the Food and Drug Administration cracks down on certain tobacco and nicotine vapor products, New York State and Virginia roll out a taxpayer-funded red carpet to megacorporation Amazon, and Los Angeles continues down the road toward a teacher strike. This morning, the Food and Drug Administration announced wide-ranging regulations on the sale of electronic cigarettes, devices which allow users to inhale nicotine vapor, and an intention to ban two flavored traditional tobacco products. FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb announced rulemakings to regulate the display of flavored e-cigarettes, requiring that store displays be sited in areas inaccessible to minors, and to prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. Federal law already restricts the sale of e-cigs to adults over 18. Some states have tougher restrictions, and prohibits the sale of cigarettes flavored with anything other than tobacco or menthol. I'll be referring to all flares other than tobacco, menthol, or mint as non-traditional flavors. That means fruit, candy, and similar ones. The ostensible reason for the existing ban on flavored cigarettes and the proposed restrictions on the sale of non-traditional flavored e-cigs is that they are appealing to underage users. Gottlieb expressed concern that flavored e-cigs are behind an increase in electronic cigarette usage, known as vaping, by minors. The ban on menthols and flavored cigars has been demanded by public health officials for a long time. Left-of-center African-American interest groups like the National Urban League and the NAACP wanted it as well, since the products are more frequently used by African-American smokers. So who wins and loses? Ironically enough, one of the winners might be e-cigarette manufacturer Juul. In anticipation of the move, amid rumors that the FDA would try to ban non-traditional flavored e-cigarettes outright, Juul had announced it would stop selling non-traditional flavors in stores, but suggested it would continue to sell flavored e-cigs online if age verification was sufficiently rigorous. For good measure, Juul manufactures menthol e-cigs, which the company will continue to sell in stores, and they could serve as a substitute product for the menthol cigarettes the FDA intends to ban. Another winner, though they will continue to complain that the regulations weren't strict enough, are prohibitionist groups like the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which had hoped for an outright ban on flavored e-cigarettes. The idea that a manufacturer of flavored e-cigarettes and people who want to ban them would both be winners from a regulation is actually surprisingly typical. Moral crusaders propose regulations, but after the regulatory process is finished, Only large manufacturers have the ability to deal with them, and that increases the large manufacturer's market position, even if the overall market is smaller. This dynamic is known as bootleggers and Baptists, after the old-fashioned prohibition. Losers probably include adult smokers who want to quit but can't break a nicotine addiction. Vaping is, so far as current evidence can determine, much less bad for the user than traditional smoking. If easier to access fruit or other flavors would have encouraged some smokers to switch, but instead they keep smoking, the FDA's plan could backfire. Other losers include convenience stores, which won't be able to sell the restricted products, and the other mainstream tobacco companies, Altria, British American Tobacco, and Imperial Tobacco, which, although they manufacture e-cigarettes, stand to lose their business in uh, in the menthol market. What we don't know is what effect these regulations will have on underage e-cigarette use. They're already getting their e-cigarette products by underhanded means, stealing them from grown-ups, using fake IDs or otherwise evading identity checks, or by getting overage friends to buy them on their behalf. It isn't clear the restrictions will keep them from obtaining e-cigarettes. And of course, if they would have vaped but decide to smoke instead, that's much, much worse. In our second item, New York and Virginia have rolled out the red carpet for Amazon at substantial expense to state and local taxpayers. The online retailer had announced a nationwide competition between cities to host the site of its secondary headquarters, known as HQ2. The company's primary headquarters is, of course, in Seattle. The company chose to split HQ2 and will have locations in Queens, New York, and the Washington, D.C. suburb of Arlington. This expansion is far from a victory for unfettered capitalism. Both locations were chosen in part because the states of New York and Virginia offered buckets of corporate welfare. Depending on the number of jobs the projects create, the total could range from $2.8 billion to $5.5 billion. For good measure, both locations agreed to help Amazon site helipads at the new company campuses. New York's corporate welfare package includes substantial special tax breaks based on the level of six-figure job creation. 
at a total of $48,000 in tax credits per job created, they could total 10 figures. Virginia offered a less substantial $22,000 in cash grants and threw in another $195 million in infrastructure improvements targeted at the Amazon campus. Arlington County will kick in another $23 million, raised from a hotel tax increase. Even the cities that lost kicked into Amazon's kitty. As part of its HQ2 search, the company obtained a large quantity of government data from the cities, data the company has reportedly retained. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo defended giving Amazon this sack of thinly-veiled legal bribes by noting New York's broadly uncompetitive, read very high, state taxes and regulations, saying, quote, It's not a level playing field to begin with. All things being equal, if we do nothing, they're going to Texas. Ideologues right and left have responded to the gifts to Amazon with outrage. Representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, complained that Amazon would be getting tax breaks when she would prefer to use the money for various government programs. Among the strange bedfellows who agree with the left-wing firebrand on the broad picture, if not all the details? A research fellow from the Conservative Heritage Foundation, the executive editor of National Review, and a senior fellow at the Libertarian Mercatus Center. And there's no light light item this week as we move on to Los Angeles. The teachers' union, United Teachers Los Angeles, continues to prepare for a strike, announcing a day of action in marches for December 15th. Earlier this month, the union rejected a proposal from the school district, which would have given teachers a raise, but did not agree to the union's demand for smaller class sizes district-wide. The district has agreed to smaller classes in high-need schools. The district's finances are already dire. Its deficit is so high that one estimate found that the district's financial reserves will drop by 90% over the next two years. UTLA, United Teachers Los Angeles, has already called a strike authorization vote, giving the union the ability to call a strike at any time, 30 days after a mediation panel submits its results. Both the union and the district have filed labor board charges against each other, alleging that the other side is is not negotiating in good faith. And again, the union has announced a march and demonstration for December 15th as it continues to organize and prepare for strike action. That's our show for this week. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have subscribed, thank you. And please leave us a five-star rating. We'll see you next week.